Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. You are listening to episode 181 of Sexology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Thank you so much for tuning in to this show. If you are a new listener, I have a gift for you. A few months ago, I curated this list of 101 ways to keep your relationship hot. And if you are thinking about kind of incorporating new ideas, new position, new concepts in the bedroom with your partner, this is the list for you. It's completely free for you and you can check it out. Today, we're going to talk about anal pleasure. It's one of those topics that there are tons of misinformation about it. But sometimes when couples are in my practice, they tell me they don't know why their partner is interested about it. Sometimes people find the idea appalling. Some other couples that I work with, they tell me that they are interested to explore it but they don't know how to start. Our guest is Tristan Tarmino. She's a sex educator and she wrote a book on this topic. And today we cover everything anal sex related. So if you are curious about this topic, this is the right episode for you. As I mentioned, our guest is Tristan Tarmino. She's a sex educator, media maker, and speaker. She's the author of eight books and editor of 20 anthologies, including the award-winning The Ultimate Guide to Anal Sex for Women and The Ultimate Guide to Kink. She keynotes, lectures, and teaches workshops around the world on sexual pleasure and health, relationship, and social justice. She is the host of the long-running podcast, Sex Out Loud. I was on her show. It was fantastic. And she is the creator of Sex Educator Bootcamp, a professional training program, and she runs a coaching and consulting business for sexuality professionals. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Tristan Tarmino. Hello and welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I am very excited and honored to have Tristan Taromino, sex educator, fellow podcaster on our show. Uh, Tristan, did I say your name, last name correctly? You did. Oh, you good. <laughs> Guys, I practiced it 10 seconds ago. <laughs> and it happens to me that sometimes it escapes me. So I'm excited to have Tristan on the show. I was on her podcast, which is fantastic. We're definitely going to tell you about how you can find her podcast. It's called Sex Out Loud a few months ago. And I'm very excited that she's on our show today. Tristan, welcome to our show. Thanks for having me. As I was sharing with you that I'm very excited about this conversation, I I was thinking about that I have over 100, around now it's like around 200 episodes, and we never talked about anal pleasure because I never found someone that's as informative, as has as much information as you, and you wrote informative content. So I think you're a wonderful person to help us kind of understand anal pleasure and things that people can do if they want to introduce it in their sexual life. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm surprised over 200 episodes you haven't talked about anal. So I'm excited to like, you know, share something new. Yes. Yes. So tell us what is the allure of anal sex for couples? Right. You know, just like with all kinds of sex, there is a physical component and then there's an emotional and psychological component. And so the physical aspects of anal sex are that it's really pleasurable, whether it's external stimulation, whether it's penetration, anal play can be really pleasurable and it could be pleasurable for both men and women. Men can receive direct prostate stimulation. Women can receive indirect G-spot stimulation. And just overall, there's lots of loss of nerve endings in that area. It's really sensitive. It's an erogenous zone that we just don't always talk about or include when we're talking about sex. But for the psychological aspects, I think, you know, anal sex is a little bit naughty. And I've been doing this work for 22 years. My, the first edition of my book came out in 1998, which is crazy to me. And, you know, people were, it was very, very, very taboo back then. And it still is taboo. Like, yes, it's being talked about in Cosmopolitan as very, you know, they're very casual and blase about it. But it still is taboo. It's a little bit naughty. Like, you shouldn't be doing it. 
And that is a real turn on for people. And it could also be a special thing. You know, many people I've talked to have said, you know, I've, I've only ever done anal sex with one partner or we don't do it that often, but when like all the planets align, we do it. And because of that sort of uniqueness, that also increases the heat factor for people. I love that you talked about both kind of like physical and psychological aspect of it, that it's interesting that as, as I shared with you in the past, that I'm coming from a, a Middle Eastern background. And I remember the first time I heard about it, my sister, when you getting married in Iran, they force you to go to sex ed class. <laughs> That's almost the opposite of sex ed. And they told her that like, no matter what, never allow your husband to have anal sex with you in the sex ed class for people who are getting married because it's it's just only for them and you're not going to get pleasure from it, which is right. so far from the truth. Oh, but that's a really common stereotype and myth that first of all, there's a couple stereotypes wrapped in there, right? First of all, there that assumes that when we say anal sex or anal penetration, the man is the giver and the woman is the receiver, mm -hmm. right? So that, first of all, that's not true, right? Everyone has a butthole and everyone can be penetrated if they want. And then the second assumption that, that male givers are having the time of their lives and female <laughs> receivers are doing it to sort of please their partners or take one for the team, it, it's just, it's not true. I mean, it's not true. When people ask me, you know, why anal pleasure? I feel like my short answer should just be for the mind-blowing orgasms it gives me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, mm, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things, but then in one straightforward way, it's just the intense pleasure that you can receive. Not everyone loves it. Not everyone likes it. But for the people who do, for me, it can be more intense than vaginal penetration. Right. And it, it, there, as you said, there's a kind of psychological component to it that you're doing something taboo. And for most people, the kind of the more taboo the context, the sexier it is. And as you said, it's erogenous zone. And many people talking about having a different experience of orgasm, whether it's a, when it's an anal penetration than vaginal penetration or any other kind of simulation of the erogenous zone. So tell us, what does anal play involve? Well, it can involve all sorts of things. That's the other thing. I think, you know, we often emphasize in sex intercourse, penis in vagina, and then we just transfer that to penis in ass. And really, there's a lot more to anal pleasure. First of all, it doesn't even have to include penetration. Lots of people just like external stimulation because even just the anal opening, the anus, is really sensitive. That puckered tissue has a lot of nerve endings in it. So whether people are doing oral anal or they're just rubbing on the outside of the anus or maybe they're putting a vibrator just on the outside, that can feel really, really good. Then, of course, if you want to do penetration, you've got fingers, you've got butt plugs, you've got dildos, and then you've got penises and you've got strap-ons. I mean, there's kind of a lot at your disposal. And I love that you talked about if you want to simulate this erogenous zone, there are different ways of doing it. So if you are curious and maybe you, for any kind of reason, you don't want to do penetration, then you can simulate it using different toys. And I know that there are specific toys that people can choose. Do you have any recommendation on how can people decide what is a good toy for that? Yeah, well, first I, I recommend silicone toys because silicone is like the grand dam of all mater soft materials of sex toys and it conducts body heat, it conducts vibration really well, it's easy to clean warm water and soap or you can put it in the top rack of the dishwasher, if that's true. And it's just the, it, it's non-porous and it's top quality. So definitely made of silicone, although there are other non-porous toys made, for example, of, of glass or hard plastic or even stainless steel, which are also great. But for beginners, I recommend something soft. And I would recommend a small butt plug. The thing about butt plugs is they're designed for your butt and they're designed to sort of go in and stay in. So if you want to experiment with just having something inside you, 
no in and out, nothing fancy, right? You just have this feeling of fullness and a little bit of pressure on the rectal walls. And then when you have a butt plug in, you can do other stuff. You can do genital stimulation. You can do masturbation. You can use a vibrator. I think a a butt plug is sort of an indispensable tool that everyone should have in their toy bag. And if I'm going to do a shout out, I think B-Vibe makes the best anal play toys out there. Just want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. And I, and I know when it comes to sex toys, people at times get confused. I don't know, they don't know what to look for. I feel mm-hmm. back in the day, it was easier when there were more stores. That I, but although going to the store also was kind of anxiety provoking for people, but they had a better understanding of what they're getting versus kind of online that it's more mysterious. So I think it's good to have some guideline around that. And one of my clients, they're a heterosexual couple, and he was telling me that they use this one that has a remote control and they kind of like playing it Mm. as a way to be more playful. Yes. Great. Yeah. So the B vibe line includes remote controls as does, I think the we vibe butt plug has a remote control. That is a fun, fun way to be playful and also to kind of start sex before you start sex, right? You can get a little bit warmed up and put the butt plug in and then go in another room and whoever has the remote control can remind the person who has the butt plug in that they're there, but they're not quite there. I mean, I think that's, that's really fun and and you want to make it playful. You know, I, I think that too many people have heard myths and misinformation about anal play and it stops them from even considering it or even experimenting with it. And I think, you know, we should all be up for exploring every possible erogenous zone in our body, right? I can agree more with, with you on that. And I love that you were saying that there's just a number of different ways that you can explore this kind of play without kind of necessarily doing it in a way that you're not comfortable or ready yet to do it. I think it arrived, causes me to think about the second complaint that I hear a lot and a hesitation that some of my clients tell me when it comes to anal play, that they kind of scared about the pain. So does it always hurt or there's a way to make it non-painful? Right. So that is also a myth. Anal sex does not have to hurt, not even a little. If it hurts, you have to listen to your body. You know, pain is a signal that something's not right. And I always tell people, you know, no pain, no gain is for the gym and is for working (laughs) out. It is not for anal sex. If you feel pain, you should stop. There's a number of things you can do. First of all, you absolutely need lube. There, and in this case, spit is not a lubricant. You absolutely need a store-bought lube because the ass doesn't self-lubricate, unlike the vagina. So you need plenty of lube and you need plenty of warm-up. I think one of the mistakes that people make is they go too far, too fast. They just get overexcited, which happens to the best of us, but they try to do too much, right? And, and I always say, if you've never had any kind of anal play and you want to do anal play by yourself or with a partner, you know, set your goal at one finger, one finger, some genital stimulation. Don't try to like, you know, push the whole penis or the whole dildo in your ass in one sitting, you really have to kind of work your way up slowly. And for a lot of people, adding stimulation, whether that's a hand job, whether that's clitoral stimulation, but adding that genital stimulation to anal penetration transforms the feeling into into feeling really nice. And I don't recommend those numbing lubes. I I do want to say that, you know, there there are a bunch of lubes out there that promise, you know, pain-free anal sex because they contain benzocaine and other numbing agents. So it's sort of like, it's what it sounds like. It's numbing your ass and people should not numb their asses. They should be 100% grounded in their body and feeling everything. So just regular lube. What a great recommendation and what a good information to know that it's not kind of necessarily one of those situations that you have to tolerate the pain, as you said. No, 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 no. It truly can be pleasurable like without the pain. And such an important point that you talked about people kind of like exploring and prepping themselves, because sometimes what I hear from my clients is that they watch it in the porn and it looks so effortless yes. and they think unless it's effortless, then it's 
it's not they're not doing it right or there's something wrong which which what they don't see is how much prep goes into the scene before exactly people that exactly and i've directed porn films and sex ed films but i've also been on the set of more than a hundred other porn films and i know first of all we have to remember that these people are professionals, right? And so they have really a lot of experience with anal sex and and their bodies have a kind of muscle memory because they do it more often than say the average person. So that really serves them well. Also, before a scene begins, or sometimes even in front of the camera, there's lots of warm up. There's rimming, which is like oral anal play. There are butt plugs, there are toys, there are fingers. That just ends up getting either not filmed or cut out of the final product. And so you just see a woman bent over and a man, you know, walks in with an erection and it's like, boom. <laughs> And, and truthfully, even for the professionals, even for these sort of super athletes of sex, they are warming up. Some, some arrive with a butt plug in their butt, you know, before the scene begins and they sit in the makeup chair for a half hour and then they start, and then they take the butt plug out. Their ass is relaxed. It's warmed up. It's ready. So, you know, everyone has their different techniques for warming up, but the idea that you can just shove it in under no circumstances ever, is that okay? Thank you for that. And thank you for sharing with us that like, what's the process like even for, for professional people who are doing it on a regular basis. And I'm, I got a little bit of flink of jealousy of you being kind of part of these scenes and <laughs> directing and kind of observing behind the scene. But I think that's, that's such a good, good information to have. The other piece that can be intimidating with prostate play, people feel like they don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they're curious about that because I feel I hear that there's a method to it. How can they gather information about that piece of it? Yeah. So first I want to say in the toy category, there are also toys made specifically for people with prostates. So they're sort of engineered and shaped in a way that is meant to stimulate the prostate. And usually they have a bit of a curve. So essentially, the way you find the prostate, if you're doing it with fingers, is you would enter someone's ass and then head towards the direction of the front of their body, right? Because it's on that front wall. And it's usually, I would say, for people with small hands, it's at the tip of your fingers. People with longer fingers, it may not be. But there you're going to find a kind of it's kind of the size and shape of a walnut, although it doesn't feel like a walnut. That's not a good thing. But it's about the size and shape of a walnut. And it has a kind of spongy quality to it because it is a gland that's full of like ducts and, you know, creates fluid. So, so, so the best thing to do is sort of aim towards the front of the body. And there are also these great hands-free toys. A Naros makes one. Rocks Off makes one a bunch of other sex toy manufacturers. And they have a curve that when you slide the toy in and you basically open and close your sphincter muscles, which we have control over, it moves the toy inside you to massage the prostate. So those are, those are really great toys. And even folks who I've talked to who've been intimidated about anal play, who've been like, I've heard there might be amazing orgasms, you know, with prostate play, but where do I begin? I think some of these beginner prostate toys are, are a really good way to start. Thank you for sharing that because I hear even from my male clients that they are more even on the conservative side. They love the prostate play and I feel like they share with me that the pleasure that they got from it was very different than other sorts of sexual pleasure and they're talk, describing it mind-blowing and it's good that there are toys that are specifically for that. You know, this is a way for people of all genders to kind of expand their sexual repertoire. You know, it makes me happy to think that men are focusing on other erogenous zones, right? Because everything is so centered around the penis. Everything's so centered around penis penetration. And so I, I love that there are more and more men, I hear from them, they come to my workshops, they write me emails, who have discovered this like newfound kind of pleasure. And they've gotten over their anxiety, they've gotten over some of the myths, they've tried it. And, you know, for some men, it's incredibly orgasmic. 
I love that. And, and I, I find myself, Kim, I love that, but I think you have fantastic points. <laughs> but I think because of like, I feel there's just too much rigidity when it comes, especially around heterosexual sex. Kind of people think it's only intercourse. And when, right. when the penis is not firm enough or, and it's not big enough, or it's all surrounding the erection. And I share with you that it can be very eye opening and exciting for many people to find other forms of sexual pleasure that's equally pleasurable and playful, but it's not centered around the penile vaginal penetration. Yeah, you know, I do some coaching, some sex coaching, less and less these days. But I remember I had a client who was a straight man. He was 75. And he said, you know, most of my friends who are my peers, who are men, are having erectile difficulties. Some of them take Viagra, some of them don't for various reasons. And he said, I discovered anal play in my 30s. And so I feel like I still have a really vibrant sex life because it doesn't necessarily involve having an erection. Right, right. And what a wonderful kind of sexual repertoire to have that, okay, mm-hmm. if I want to, I don't want to lean into this, this way right now, this other thing is available to me versus kind of thinking about that's the only way. So I think we, we sold that idea to many people, or at least like I'm sure many of our listeners are interested to try. So if people who have never experimented with it, what are some of the recommendations you have if they're interested to explore it? Well, one thing I think is if you're having any anxiety or fears, you should talk to your partner, right? I think it's important for us to sort of get out on the table what we're thinking about before we do it. I think it's okay to address concerns. It's okay to say, oh, I have this girlfriend and she told me it was really painful or there was blood or, you know, she did it when she was drunk and it was awful, you know, or, or whatever people have. That's all like swirling around in their heads, you know. You got to put that out on the table and, and you've got to make sure you have the facts and the real information. Also, if you're nervous about doing it with a partner, I highly recommend taking it off the table in partner sex and making it part of your solo sex practice. That way you can really go at your own pace. You can take your time. You can go absolutely as slowly as you want. There's no pressure. Often we feel pressure, pressure for it to be good, pressure to please our partners, you know, pressure for sex to be wonderful, even the first time. And so I think doing it by yourself and just letting you go at your own pace. Not only is that going to help you feel more comfortable with a partner, you may also learn some things about what you like or try a specific toy that you like. And then you can give them that information. You know, I've experimented with this or this, and this is what feels best for me. And I think one of the challenges that at times come up, even having this conversation with your partner because of how taboo it is and all sorts of misconceptions that people have. So if they, someone want to kind of bring it up with a partner, but they kind of feel scared or shame because they think mm-hmm. like, you know, they have issues around that. Is there any way they can kind of approach it more kind of skillfully? Yeah. You know, I am a super direct person. And so I am the type of person who would say, hey, do you want to have sex? And then I would specifically say, hey, do you want to have anal sex? I realize that I'm, I'm, I'm in a very small minority of people who speak really directly. <laughs> so the other thing I tell people is I'm not that great in the seduction category. <laughs> I mean, I could whisper that in your ear in a seductive way, but like I, there's not a lot of buildup. I, I really express my desire like boom, right? That's just, I'm from New York. I'm very direct. That, that's, that's my style. <laughs> But I think, especially if you're, you don't know how your partner is going to react or they've never talked about it, it's okay, first of all, to bring it up in an indirect way. They can absolutely say, I listened to the sexology podcast the other day. They were both talking about anal sex. What do you think of that? That feels like an open-ended question. That feels like a prompt for discussion and a conversation rather than I want to have anal sex with you, which feels very direct and may put pressure on someone and they may not know how to react. I also think it's really important to talk about new stuff, not in the middle of sex. I think that that can sort of bring things to a screeching halt, especially if someone's hearing something for the first time and you don't know anything about it. I think that talking outside of the bedroom and really working on, hey, do you want to try this? Do you want to experiment with this? 
and also emphasizing the mutual pleasure. I really want to explore this with you and I want it to feel good for both of us. And I think it can because I'm going to follow all the directions. We're going to warm up. We're going to go really slow. We're going to start with fingers or a very small butt plug. We're going to use a ton of lube. You know, the person on the receiving end is going to talk to the person on the giving end and really talk them through it. So just emphasizing that this is something fun and something we can explore together rather than being like, I want to do this to you or or I want you to do this to me, which I feel like doesn't, isn't the way that we should be interacting with our partners anyway. Right. And and I think this point of not talking about it or not kind of like exposing something or putting pressure on people to do something in the middle of sex is so important because sometimes we feel self-conscious, we're uncomfortable talking about things before, and then we can think we can introduce those kind of like in the middle of the sex and the partner would be willing to, which, which sometimes people are. But I think you will be kind of setting yourself for success if you have a conversation before and mm-hmm. You're going in with preparation, with having a conversation about it. And the other piece is that I think for like any other sexual experiences, it's my experience if you go in with low expectation. You don't <laughs> think that you're going in like a, you're like this uh, a sex worker that does this magical things with the body. I'm thinking about, okay, we're exploring this. It might work or might not work. And then let's have also another backup plan of things that we know that's exciting as well. So we wouldn't put pressure on ourselves. Yeah, and that raises two really important points. One is that you may try it and not like it, and that's okay. I mean, we have so many things on the menu, and there are people who have preferences. You know, like, I don't like strawberry ice cream. You know, it's like it could be artisanal, small batch from the grocery store. I'm just not into strawberries and strawberry ice cream. I like strawberries, fresh strawberries, but I'm not into it once you make it ice cream. But I like a lot of other flavors of ice cream. So I I really want to, I want to, I want people to go in saying, hey, we're going to try it and see what it's like. The other thing I want to say is that if you're a beginner, it may feel strange. It may feel uncomfortable at first. Not, I don't want you to feel any pain. I do not want you to feel pain. But we're used to pushing things out of our butt, not taking things inside our butt. So lots of beginners say, you know, it took me a few times to get used to the feeling. Like my butt just wasn't used to it. And I was a little bit surprised and I was a little bit disoriented. And so I couldn't quite get to the pleasure because I was still like, what is this new sensation? So that's okay too, if it feels strange at first. It should. Nothing feels perfect and great the first time. So I encourage people, if you do it once and you have sort of a, huh, I don't know experience, try it again. Right. And it, sometimes I tell my clients that if you don't hate something, obviously you don't want to do something that's... Uh, no, if you dislike it, it, you're going to not <laughs> right. do it. Right. Like right. not do it. But if you feel neutral or maybe slightly negative, give the act maybe like three times chance to see that if it's really it's for you or not. Because I feel, as you said, that when we're doing new new things, maybe we, we're not even comfortable with the sensation because it's a new sensation. And then you might close the door too soon on the act if you're not giving it enough chance. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. And the butt doesn't lie. I like to say that, you know, <laughs> the sphincter muscles will just shut the door if they don't want to have anal penetration. So there's no, you can't force your way in. You can't fake your way in. You really, you have to be fully on board, mind and body. Well, one question that I got from our of one of my Instagram followers that she was talking about, is it any amount of lube that would be too much lube? Is that, is that a possibility? I mean, I think there's no such thing as too much lube. Certainly, there are people with penises who say, if there's too much lube, I lose some friction. I lose some feeling. But I think the lube is acting as two things. The lube is acting to make things wetter and better, to make the penetration comfortable, possible, pleasurable. And it's also acting as a little bit of cushion inside that delicate rectum. You know, part of why it's such sensitive tissue and it feels so good is also because it's very delicate tissue. So you have to treat it nicely and gently. And so I am of the mind there's no such thing as too much lube. 
I agree with you, and I think maybe if you're doing vaginal kind of penile penetration because of how vaginal wall works and with the lubrication, maybe you can get away without using lubes. But I think because of that, like we don't have the natural lubricant in that area, then it's definitely essential to use lubes because yeah. of to prevent all sort of even breakage and STI and all of those things that can be a side effect of any sort of sexual behavior. Yeah, no, it is true. They're different orifices <laughs> and they act differently and they're made up of different tissue. So there's some things you can get away with, quickies or a little bit of spit. We've all done it in the vagina that you can't get away with in the ass. Mm-hmm. Right, right. So I bet like our listeners are kind of dying to know more about <laughs> where can they get more information about this? I know you have the book and also you have your podcast. So if yeah. people are interested to get more of the wonderful content that you shared with us today, what are some of the places that they can go? Well, my book is called The Ultimate Guide to Anal Sex for Women. Now, it's written from a woman's point of view, but it's for women who have sexual partners of all genders. So there's an entire chapter on men's anal pleasure. Just want people to know. So the book is not just for women. I mean, you can get that wherever you get you get books, including that big online marketplace. I mean, you can get it a paper copy or a Kindle. And I also, on my website, which is not safe for work, puckerup.com, I have a section called the anal advisor where I answer anal questions. So it's good before you try to email me to search and see if your question has been answered because there's hundreds on there. And then my podcast is called Sex Out Loud. A new episode goes up every Monday across the regular podcast platforms. So Apple, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want a direct link, you can go to sexoutloudradio.com. Excellent. So guys, if you are interested to check out any of these resources, the link will be in the show notes. Thank you so much, Tristan, for coming on the show. And it was my pleasure to have you answer all of our questions. It was so much fun. It was really, it's so great to talk to you. Thank you. Have a lovely day. I hope you found our conversation useful and hopefully we answered some of the questions that you guys had about this topic. I hope that if you are neutral about this, maybe you can explore this erogenous zone by kind of like exploring it in a way that it feels safe and comfortable for you. Some of my clients, they tell me that they explore it during masturbation because it's easier for them to pay attention to their body when they're not with their partner. At the end, I wanted to also remind you that thanks to all of you, my wonderful listener, this month we passed 1 million downloads. As a way to say thank you, whoever that writes us review in iTunes, I will mail them a bottle of Uber Lube. The main thing is you need to live in the United States and you need to send me a kind of picture of the review. So I know you wrote it. Send it to my Instagram account at Sexology Podcast or you can email me at Dr. Moali at Sexology podcast.com. I love you guys. And thank you so much for spending some time with me. I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.